The Satanic Temple has only been around for about a decade, but they've already had a massive impact on those around them. Whether that's by arranging for LGBTQ couples to kiss on the grave of the Westboro Baptist Church founder's mother, or through their advocacy for abortion rights, or the extremely alarming anti-Semitic remarks of one of the temple's founders, because of course that had to be a thing. Everyone knows them for something a little different. Today, I want to get to the bottom of who the Satanic Temple is, how they work, and if they truly advocate for others in the way they claim. Hello everyone, and welcome to The Corporate Casket. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're going to be talking about the Satanic Temple, or TST for short. After the recent news about Roe v. Wade potentially stripping away many women of their access to abortion rights, and of course, the right to medical privacy, a lot of people have been searching for ways to support the pro-choice movement. Perhaps an unlikely, but largely welcomed resource has come in the form of the Satanic Temple. The group has made waves in recent years. For example, they created the After School Satan Club, which is really just a lot of games and crafts for kids. These aren't meant to indoctrinate, but push back on the Christian programs that thousands of schools offer, such as the Good News program. They're about offering alternatives and well-known streamers like Hassan Abi have played clips of their meetings borrowed from Channel 5. They seem like reasonable people who value science and logic and their cause of rejecting tyrannical authority and opposing injustice has resonated with many. Some have also begun to see the TST as a way to protect their abortion rights by claiming it as a religious abortion ritual. Their ritual revolves around seeing the body as inviolable, subject to one's own will alone, which is one of the church tenets. The Satanic Temple is using religion to protect women's abortion rights. Therefore, women in need should see them as a resource and we should donate to them for their service, right? Well, if they're here on an episode of Corporate Casket, then, you know, not so fast. How successful have they been at actually doing this? And are they really supporting these women? In 2015, one Mary Doe went to the TST for exactly this reason. According to the Riverfront Times, she became the plaintiff at the heart of a legal campaign that was part satire and part earnest fight for civil rights. She argued that bodily autonomy was within her religious beliefs. And as you can imagine, her case started to drag on within the courts. The case became extremely high profile though, strangely, not really about women's rights in the way Mary would have hoped. The TST's Detroit chapter produced a counter protest outside a Planned Parenthood location in which Satanists portrayed priests who reverently doused two kneeling actresses with milk. And some carried signs amplifying the myth that the clinic harvest baby parts. Someone else held a sign with the words, America is not a theocracy and forced motherhood. Mary said that it just wasn't how she wanted to be represented and that she felt shamed by the suggestion that she'd been nearly forced into motherhood. I thought it was a giant mockery, she stated. Between the I am Mary t-shirts they sold and the actual refusal to hold rallies in Missouri, this made those close to the case believe that TST didn't actually care about real change, just the publicity around it. And this is where things get complicated to put it mildly. Mary Doe was a 22 single mom in Missouri when this case began and she became disillusioned at how long it was taking. She wrote to both the church's founder spokesperson, Lucian Greaves and the TST attorney claiming that she wanted out of the case. However, she was the Satanic Temple's first plaintiff in a case like this. This was their chance to prove themselves. Greaves got pissed and according to Mary, the following occurred. Lucian just completely lost his temper. He was just screaming. He was talking fast. I couldn't get a word in edgewise. After he hung up, I tried to call him back a couple times, but it didn't work. So I just blocked his number. Mary claims that after this, the temple's attorney, James McNaughton, begged her not to damage his reputation by leaving the high profile case and she acquiesced. Now he does of course deny this because a lawyer refusing to drop a client's case in this manner could actually have him disbarred. In 2016, he proposed a gag order on Mary with financial repercussions if she tried to meddle in the case. Mary's case stalled and was lost, but abortion access in Missouri did expand, but it had nothing to do with the temple though, as it was based on an entirely separate 2016 Supreme Court ruling in regards to medically unnecessary restrictions on abortion providers. However, as former member Nikki Mongo stated, the church made it seem like this was their victory. Quote, they called this little clusterfuck a win. In essence, what appeared to happen here is that Mary Doe went to them for help. They made a theatrical display at Planned Parenthood. She wanted out. TST's lawyer and leader suggested a gag order instead. Then when abortion access did expand for an entirely different reason, they attempted to take credit. So just off of this one example, is this really who we want to defend abortion rights? If it's true that Mary wanted out of the case, then I do think the temple's lawyer should have been disbarred for trying to continue it if that's factually accurate. And Greaves should be ashamed of himself. 
many women feel they aren't heard right now more than ever. And this is not an example of them being heard. Their lawsuits in regards to abortions have struggled. And even their critics explain that TST's marketing simply does not match their reality. Even fellow Satanists such as the Church of Satan have referred to the temple's actions as a publicity stunt and tweeted, "'It's stupid to think associating Satanism and abortion would help anyone. It sure does seem like a way to make it harder for people to actually get abortions in the future. However, this hasn't stopped the temple from trying. They currently have another lawsuit about abortion pending in Texas where they're advocating for and Doe. So are these publicity stunts from an organization that just doesn't really care or genuine efforts from an unorthodox religion? I've seen some mixed statements and today we're going to attempt to find out. Before we truly get into everything, I do need to put a disclaimer here. Although there are some legal documents and reputable sources referenced throughout this episode, a substantial amount of my information also comes from Queer Satanic, a small group consisting of four former members of the church named David, Nathan, Joshua, and Leah. Although they do have supporters and consistently reference court documents throughout their allegations, as QS even admits, they are biased. With that being said, discussing everything TST has been accused of would take ages. So I'm going to try and break everything down as best as I can into easy to understand sections, but please know that for the rest of the episode, there will be some radically charged and insensitive comments made on part of temple members, particularly Lucian Graves, their founder slash leader, and brief mentions of sexual assault. If you are sensitive to either of these, I recommend checking out a different episode at this point. With that being said, let's get into it. The Satanic Temple became active in 2013 and was originally formed to prove a point. One of the first acts of the two founders, Malcolm Jerry and Lucian Greaves, and these are both pseudonyms anyway, was to send a letter to the State Capital Preservation Commission offering to construct a monument to Satan. At the time, there was a legal dispute over a monument over the 10 commandments outside a courthouse in Oklahoma. The proposal was Jerry's idea, but it was Greaves that became the TST spokesperson when he told CNN that they wanted kids to see that Satanism is where the fun is. Obviously, this sparked a lot of controversy with some saying they were nuts, but others like the ACLU Oklahoma chapter were tentatively supportive. If the 10 commandments could stay, then the satanic temple's monument should be allowed too, right? From what I can gather, it seemed pretty straightforward at the time. Either the separation of church and state should be clear with no religious monuments at the Oklahoma Capitol whatsoever, which would be my preference personally, or other religious monuments need to be welcomed too. But whether the church was joking or not, people believed in their case and enough to donate money. When CNN reported the story, they said that TST created an Indiegogo to fund their statue and their donations went from only $150 to about $30,000, well over their $20,000 goal. The eight foot six statue they eventually created likely cost over $100,000. And today it's on display at their headquarters in Salem, Massachusetts. Whether or not Jerry and Greaves actually intended for TST to be taken seriously to begin with has been debated a bit throughout my sources. The Church of Satan, a different satanic organization founded in the 1960s has criticized TST for this, claiming the temple was originally conceived as a backlash to US President Bush era religious protections. And Greaves himself has not denied this. On his website, he states, well, why not? In the George W. Bush era, it became quite apparent that other religions needed to challenge Christian exceptionalism. It is unclear what this fact is attempting to establish. Again, an organization should serve an organized purpose. This message genuinely resonated with people and joke or not, Jerry and Greaves seemed to work well together. They both held degrees from Harvard and during a 2012 meeting at a Harvard faculty club, they joined forces over a debate about public schools. The two men agreed that the function of public schools isn't to educate, but inculcate compliance with authority. As both of them grew up impacted by the satanic panic, they also shared a passion in showing the preferential treatment other religions such as Christianity hold over Satanism. Though they gained attention with the statue, their first real movement came later in 2013 with the Pink Mass. To summarize what happened here, the founder of the Westboro Baptist Church, Fred Phelps, announced that he intended to picket the funerals of the Boston Marathon bombing victims. Jerry and Greaves in retaliation decided to take photos of gay couples kissing all over the grave of Phelps's mother, Katherine Johnston. This took place in July, 2013, and once again, made headlines. They posthumously declared Catherine a lesbian and mocked the Westboro Baptist Church, turning their own talking points around on them. 
Considering just how many people justifiably despise the beliefs and actions of the Westboro Baptist Church, this went over incredibly well, and the pink mass was pretty successful. Greaves did also have a photo of himself with his genitals on the grave, which is inarguably gross and disrespectful. But aside from that charge of desecration of a grave, even though the grave itself was not harmed, people were overall supportive. And I also believe that one of the reasons they were so successful is because they were proving the doubters and haters wrong, despite him practically teabagging a grave. The stereotype of Satanists being violent, awful, gory people is absolutely a thing, but here they were protesting by kissing over a grave. Yes, the genital part is disrespectful, but considering that the Westboro Baptist Church was literally protesting the funerals of those who died in a bombing, the temple easily came out looking better than Westboro here. Articles actually said at the time that the temple had become an unlikely ally for the LGBTQ plus community, even if their methods were unorthodox to say the least. Greaves tweeted out that since religion is a protected class, people should start ordering Satan cakes from anti-LGBTQ bakeries. Greaves said that he hoped his efforts would make the Supreme Court consider adding sexual orientation as a protected class or take away religion as a protected class status. Once again, the satanic temple found themselves garnering more praise. But again, was this all deserved? Was the temple actually practicing what they were literally preaching? One of the first and most massive accusations hurled against the temple is that they're racist. Shane Bugby published an article in 2013 stating that he had republished a tome called Might is Right, which was long forgotten by most, but that Greaves wanted to borrow from him. Bugby praised Greaves in his article and talks about how they've been friends for years, even before he went by Greaves, but he was still called Doug Misico or Doug Messner in the early 2000s. Bugby also recalls that when he first got into podcasting around this time, he invited Greaves, then Doug, for a first ever live 24 hour streaming broadcast. For 24 hours straight, we interviewed guests, philosophized and argued. It was so great, we did another one a year later. In this article, Greaves' friend paints a picture of a group of philosophical activists wanting to build people up. They don't want an authoritarian structure of a cult, but Bugby says the church is, if anything, an anti-cult. And while that sounds well and good, what Bugby was actually promoting is a little bit different. The might is right hasn't just been criticized for taking the attitude of a teenager who hates everything around him. It also describes women as two thirds womb, the other third being a network of nerves and sentimentality. The author also makes periodic racist remarks and this manifesto has literally been referred to by white supremacist shooters, such as one 19 year old that killed three people and wounded a dozen more at a festival in Northern California in 2019. It's a staple among neo-Nazis as NBC puts it. And the author who went by the pseudonym Redbeard argued that strength and violence determined what is normally right. But we're not here to discuss this horrific book. Instead, let's address the beliefs of the temple. Does Greaves actually believe the things this book says? Perhaps unsurprisingly, it appears that he does. More than that, Greaves has said some extremely disgusting, racist and anti-Semitic things himself. Much of it is from that podcast that Bugby mentioned on the 2003 Might Is Right 24 hour radio special. At one point during the podcast, this is said by Greaves and this is, this is a quote. So here it is. It's okay to hate Jews if you hate them because they're Jewish and they wear a stupid fucking Frisbee on their head and walk around thinking they're God's chosen people. I feel disgusting reading that. Now, Greaves has argued that these comments are old and said when he was in his twenties as he's now in his forties and they're out of context. Although just for a reality check here, I don't know where that could be contextually okay to say, but all right. They were also supposedly meant to be more anti-theist or militant atheist than anti-Semitic. So then let's explore that context, shall we? Cause I can't find it. So let's try and find it. On the program, a caller named Gerard Staff and Doug AKA Greaves are talking about how Hitler ruined eugenics and that eugenics isn't all that bad. Staff says Hitler gave eugenics a bad name and Greaves agreed saying that it threw the baby out with the bathwater and that anti-Semitic isn't a bad word to him. It just depends. This is where that Frisbee line comes in. And Greaves says that satanic Jews are fine by him as in Jews that have converted to Satanism. Bugby disagrees stating quote, Jew blood, one drop of Jew blood means you ain't breaking bread with me, motherfucker. Someone laughs and then Doug states, look at me, I'm an Aryan king. So yeah, does that context make the comments better? Because um, I actually think it makes it worse. 
And while I did refer to the book, Speak of the Devil by Joseph Laycock for my research, it is endlessly upsetting to see that he just called this a moment of cringe. Cringe, that's what we're gonna reduce this to, just cringy. Accidentally calling your teacher mom is cringe. This is abhorrent. It doesn't really help that the caller is apparently a Holocaust denier either, which also just boggles my mind. How can you simultaneously be a Holocaust denier while also saying that Nazis existed and ruined the concept of eugenics for everyone? Just trying to make sense of all of this gives me one hell of a headache. If I try and really, really try to read between many, many lines here, then it seems like what Greaves was trying to say was that eugenics should be about only letting smart people reproduce, given that he talks about breeding later on in the podcast, and Hitler, quote, ruined this concept by making it about killing Jews. And again, even with all the context, what he said remains disgusting, despicable, and very worthy of condemnation. This is not someone that should be a leader of a church, no matter what the supposed context of the words are. And by the way, we read through hours worth of this podcast transcript, and there is no context that makes this better. And by the way, it will be available in my sources if you too wanna dig into the hours of these transcripts. But of course, it's more acceptable because he was in his early 20s and it was a debate before the church was founded. Like, what, what kind of logic is that? Like, absolutely not. Greaves was old enough to know what he was saying. This isn't some little snippet. This was a 24 hour long radio show where he consistently said offensive, dehumanizing and horrific remarks. They literally played an anti-black racist song on the air, which I can't say the full name because it's gonna have the N word in it, but it's called Some N Words Never Die, They Just Smell That Way. So you'll have to excuse me if I don't think context is gonna make any of that more acceptable. There is nothing acceptable about any of this. Now. If Graves condemned his previous statements, perhaps I'd be like, yeah, that's really fucked up, but clearly he's been doing a lot of work to change that perception of things he said in the past and clearly the way he feels. However, when these racist statements came to light, he just attempted to justify them. And yet this isn't the reason Satanic Temple members began breaking off from the church because somehow it gets worse. In 2018, Twitter suspended the accounts of two Satanic Temple leaders. Greaves claimed that Twitter was discriminating against their religion and stated, quote, there are deeper ramifications for society at large when social media can suspend your account just because of discrimination. We think there's uniform standards with clear metrics, but really they are corruptible by individual prejudices. All that the Temple and Greaves account did were retweet a different account that had been threatening to burn down their Salem headquarters. Yet Greaves retweeted that violence and sparked a suspension, whereas the original threat didn't. Now I can absolutely see where the frustration and outrage would come from this. And I do think that Twitter failed the Satanic Temple in this case. However, when the Temple decided to take action and sue Twitter, it was the lawyer that they hired that had a lot of people giving them funny looks. Allow me to introduce Mark Rendaza. And you might be saying, Blair, who is this? I don't recognize this name. Well, maybe it'll help if I give you some context as to who he represents. Mark Randaza is a First Amendment lawyer who has represented Alex Jones, other alt-right figures and neo-Nazis like Andrew Anglin, the founder of the neo-Nazi site Daily Stormer. Now, you might think that just because someone represents some very disturbing beliefs legally, it doesn't mean that they themselves share in the ideals. Unfortunately, this is absolutely the case for this lawyer. In 2017, he published an article on Pope Hat recommending that child porn be legalized. His reasoning is incredibly strange because on one hand, he says that producers of actual child porn aren't punished enough, but that consumers of it shouldn't be punished. He equates photos of children in bathtubs, like ones that parents might take to CP, stating that these kinds of photos shouldn't be banned. And no one is trying to ban a photo of a kid taking a bath. And to compare that to child porn is disingenuous and dangerous. He does mention another case from 2006 when a 34 year old police officer had legal sexual relationships with a 16 and 17 year old in Indiana. However, though the relationships were legal, the officer also filmed them doing sex acts and was sentenced to prison time for CP. This is what Randazza seems to argue against. He says that it's warped how the relationship was legal, but the filming wasn't. And if we're gonna be frank here, I don't think a 34 year old cop should have been allowed to date a 16 year old girl in the first place, but I digress. Some TST members weren't happy that Greaves had hired this lawyer and it became a breaking point. One of their chapters, the Satanic Temple Los Angeles left the temple entirely. Greaves insisted he didn't care what his lawyer believed and that using him as counsel isn't tantamount to co-signing his other clients. 
Still, Randeza was questionable enough to actually have his license suspended for ethics violations, although the suspension never went into effect. Those who got past Greaves' anti-Semitic remarks, believing he apologized and grew from it, could not get past this. In addition to the LA chapter, a UK chapter and Portland, Oregon chapter also departed from the temple. Emma Story wrote an article on Medium in 2018 about why she too was leaving. Emma explained that when she joined TST, she really didn't mind that she and Greaves had different beliefs, and she wrote, Greaves thinks it's terrible that protests prevented Milo Yiannopoulos from speaking at Cal Poly. I was delighted. That it's bad news that many social media and podcasting platforms recently banned conspiracy theorist Alex Jones. I think it's very good and long overdue. And that hate speech as a concept is too nebulous to legislate and thus should be left alone. I think hate speech is bad and to pretend otherwise in 2018 is intellectual dishonesty. What did it matter what Greaves believed, so long as she agreed with the church's values, tenets, and mission? Well, for Emma, when they hired Randazza, it sent a message to the world. How can we expect people from vulnerable minority groups to believe a word we say when we're busy allying ourselves with a man who spends his time working for and befriending a literal neo-Nazi? Emma said that she joined the temple to do vital work, as many do. TSD isn't just about Satanism. That's not why many people are even there. It's about the advocacy, the reproductive freedom, and the separation of church and state. They were a religion that in many ways was made for the modern world and those that wanted to make a difference. So to align with Randazza isn't just disgusting, but it actually goes against everything the church claimed to stand for. Slowly but surely, one of the most notable chapters began to break off, the Seattle chapter. The reason why they're especially noteworthy is because these former members later created Queer Satanic, one of the most outspoken critics of TST, and the temple has sued them because of it. Essentially for a couple years, the Seattle chapter started to take a more critical approach to the church. Queer Satanic alleges that one of their earlier concerns was what the temple was doing with the financial support they received. After all, Randaza was supposedly doing this case pro bono, meaning he would only take a portion of anything he wins. So why was TST raising $50,000 at the time for legal fees? When you do look closer, it doesn't even seem like the church actually filed the lawsuit, but just a complaint that Greaves made public for fundraising efforts. Queer Satanic says that no explanation has ever been given for this. In later years, they've also stated how Greaves misappropriates church funds for personal funds, referring to a court document in which Greaves paid himself thousands of dollars from TST money. As an aside, the name Doug Mensner is in these court documents and that's his legal name apparently. Lucian Greaves is the pseudonym that many people know him as. Now, needless to say, Greaves was not happy with the criticism and in 2020, they filed a lawsuit seeking just under $150,000 in damages against Queer Satanic. Newsweek reported, the lawsuit contends that four ex-members were removed from their positions, but managed to later hack into TST Facebook pages and post damaging material under the TST names. TST also alleged that former member named Mickey Meeham had suggested that the Washington TST chapter supported ableism, misogyny, and racism. Queer Satanic denied this, and in February, 2021, the suit was dismissed. Judge Richard A. Jones said that their vanity URLs to Facebook weren't considered public domains under the Anti-Cybersquatting Consumer Protection Act. Though TST certainly raised some red flags because of this, it's largely been queer satanic and other former members that began to really cast out on the temple. As the years went by and this case was dismissed, it turns out that they had a lot to say and people started asking lots of questions too. And before we get into even more of these criticisms of the satanic temple, let's take a quick moment to have today's sponsors. Online shopping is not slowing down anytime soon. So is your business ready to keep up the pace? Well, with ShipStation, you'll never have to worry about shipping again. Make the switch to a solution that handles all your shipping needs quickly, affordably, and painlessly. You can save time by funneling all your orders into one simple interface, and it doesn't matter where you're selling. Manage every order from Amazon, eBay, Etsy, or even your own website, and from anywhere, even your phone. That's honestly one of my favorite parts of ShipStation is how easy it is to just kind of import all your data from all other places, whether it's the Instagram store, your own website, wherever, and it's just right there and all easy to manage. ShipStation is already trusted by over 100,000 e-commerce sellers and it keeps track of your orders. It finds the best shipping carrier with deeply discounted rates and you can automate just about any shipping task in just a few clicks, which is kind of sick. So ship more in less time with ShipStation. Use my offer code casket to get a 60 day free trial. That's two months free of no hassle, stress free shipping at your fingertips. Just go to ShipStation.com, click on the microphone at the top of the page and type in casket. ShipStation, make ship happen. Now, what is the key to consistent good hair days? Using ingredients that benefit your hair is probably one of the most important steps. Function of Beauty makes hair care products that are 100% customizable and made for your hair where it is now and where you want it to go. 
Function of Beauty is the world's first fully customizable hair care that creates individually filled shampoos, conditioners, styling, and treatment formulas based on your hair now, and of course, where you want your hair goals to be. And Function of Beauty offers 54 trillion possible formulations. That's T, trillion with a T. So every one of these formulations is vegan and cruelty-free and they never use sulfates or parabens. And you can even choose an option to go completely silicone free. And it's super easy. All you do is take the quick hair quiz to build your hair profile and select your five hair goals like lengthening, volumizing, and oil control. Then you pick your color and fragrance. And I really like the peach fragrance and I also like the blue colors. I know peach and the color blue don't really go together, but you can make it happen with Function of Beauty, which is so awesome. And it's simple as that. You get your formula delivered straight to your door and just prepare for the good days ahead. Start using your products and enjoying it. So say goodbye to generic hair care for good. Go to functionofbeauty.com casket to take your hair goals quiz and you can save 25% on your first order. Again, make sure you go to functionofbeauty.com casket to let them know you heard it from our show and get 25% off your first order. That's functionofbeauty.com casket to take your hair quiz and save 25% on your first order. A lack of financial transparency has become a noteworthy issue for the church since this case. They gained a tax exempt status in 2019 as a church, but Arkansas in particular is struggling to get to the bottom of its finances. The Arkansas Democrat Gazette reported that TST didn't turn over documents in their 10 commandments lawsuit. Remember the suit about having a religious monument in the state capitol? Well, in order to sue as the satanic temple, they needed to present documents about their identity and finances, but they seemed hesitant to do so according to Michael Cantrell, an attorney with the office of Arkansas Attorney General. More than hesitant, they kept giving him the runaround. They claim that they are the United Federation of Churches, LLC. They claim to be the Satanic Temple, Inc., repeatedly rejected requests and refused to turn over documents on the grounds that the Satanic Temple is not, quote, unquote, a discrete entity, Cantrell said. We've asked the court to compel the Satanic Temple to provide documents responsive to those requests. If TST genuinely wants to advocate for people, whether over a monument or abortion rights, why so hesitant to say who they are? Queer Satanic tried to shed some light on this in their Medium article about the situation. They explained that this 10 commandments case has gone on for an extremely long time, but rather than let the ACLU do its job on the first amendment litigation, the temple has continually filed motions and inserted themselves in a way that delays the case. Their lawyer, Matt Kazia said that he turned over everything, but Cantrell continues to accuse TST of being less than forthcoming. Apparently this case was already under control and already being dealt with in litigation, but Greaves continued his dozens of filings over a mutual grudge. The ACLU and state have allegedly gotten frustrated with TST and dug into them, finding that Greaves has quite a few more nonprofits to his name. When they created the Baphomet statue, Greaves and Jerry, whose real name is Stephen Soling, also created the United Federation of Churches LLC, a for-profit company, not a nonprofit. The United Federation of Churches, no LLC in the title, holds the trademark for the temple, their circular symbol with the skull and pentagram in the symbol. Greaves explained all these organizations' names before, claiming that there are four corporate entities in total, the United Federation of Churches, the Satanic Temple, the Reason Alliance of all of which are nonprofits, then Xenophobia, a for-profit LLC that works with content creators and filmmakers. Are you confused yet? Getting to the bottom of Greaves' finances is tricky, but in black and white, Greaves said that though TST is tax exempt, it can engage in for-profit commerce like an online store, which goes into a general fund. Queer Satanic explains. Greaves is essentially saying, I thought it was totally normal and on the level to be able to refer to the satanic temple as a for-profit or non-profit as needed, despite them sharing the same building, website, and owners, just whatever was most convenient at the time. Greaves even filed their suit against Queer Satanic and the United Federation of Churches LOC, all while fundraising for their non-profit church. I recommend checking out Queer Satanic's articles on their finances for a better understanding of what's going on here because I admit it is a bit difficult to follow. And for a church that wants to be different, why does it feel like I'm trying to deconstruct a televangelist finances all over again from the megachurch episode? Of course, TST doesn't make nearly as much money as you know those megachurches do, and it stands to reason that the more they grow, the more they're going to make. TST claims that they want to be better than the other options out there. So why not be transparent? That is a big deal. Not only was church money seemingly vanishing, but it was also funding organizations that have been accused of defending child sexual abuse, which I guess isn't surprising when you consider the lawyer they hired. One of these is FMSF or False Memory Syndrome Foundation. This foundation argues that victims of abuse, especially children, can't be trusted. 
Two FMSF board members have also given an interview to a pro pedophilia magazine and Queer Satanic claims that Greaves is an admin of the Facebook group False Memory Syndrome Network under another one of his pseudonyms, Mikoto Nikura. As this is allegedly a pseudonym, I cannot confirm how accurate it is. It's hard to even know for sure just how they operate in this regard because chapter leaders are required to sign non-disparagement clauses that would remain in effect even if they leave the Satanic Temple. This doesn't mean that people are afraid to speak out. I can't say that for certain but it does mean that if there were people wanting to speak out, they may be more hesitant to do so. Again, for a church that truly wants to advocate for freedoms and autonomy, this feels like a bit of a move that contradicts all of that. People have started to notice this bit by bit. Other pro-choice online communities like Witches versus Patriarchy state in their resource section that they can't stand with TST, but largely speaking, I haven't seen that many condemn them. Queer Satanic has also dug into the history of the founders. Aside from talking about Greaves' history, they've also revealed that Jerry, AKA Steven Soling, once went to the South Pacific island of Tana and attempted to convince people that he was the returned messianic cargo cult figure, John Frum. This was part of a film project, by the way. He says when he first visited the island in 2007 and Queer Satanic alleges he continued to travel there until about 2014, even after the Satanic temple was founded. Fortunately for us, there are those that have spoken out just as Queer Satanic has done. Now, although this next section will be largely anecdotal, I wanted to share the stories of these former members and see if I can get to the root of how the temple operates. But before I do that though, I want to stress that this is not how every chapter may operate. I'm sure that there are great chapter leaders out there that really do advocate against religious discrimination and promote autonomy and moral tenets. One TST drive in Utah even donated thousands of pairs of socks with the director of that campaign stating that he appreciated how the first tenant of the temple is all about compassion and empathy. By all means, there are great TST members. It's just that the temple itself and those that run the organization like Greaves are not people I can personally support based on the information we've already discussed. Aside from Emma, many former members of TST left in 2018, all of them with a unique insight I want to share. Jex Blackmore, for instance, said that he was stepping down from his position as a spokesperson and member of the temple after he was asked to step away from his role as a spokesperson for making comments about executing the president, the president being Trump at the time. Jex left the church entirely, stating that there was no effort to seek clarification regarding the context and meaning of the work in his speeches. And honestly, I could see why the temple would want him to step down, but it's what he says later in the article that actually caught my attention. While I was part of the organization, I witnessed male members of the organization exploit their position and influence to behave inappropriately and disrespectfully towards women. I myself experienced harassment and abuse from members who have now left the organization. I was not supported by my leadership during these times, but was asked to let it all blow over. He also claimed that they host whitewashed panels and there's been no effort to create a diverse membership without racism and sexism. Their legacy is hypocritical, Jack states. Another former member, Aria, had a similar complaint as she posted in her blog in 2021. She stated that she was an unpaid volunteer for months, putting in about 900 hours worth of work to help the community before she received a job with the organization. She claims to have signed an NDA before she was terminated from her role at TSTVHQ the TST virtual headquarters for reasons that remain unclear to her. She speculates it's because of her own coven and personal work and states that one of the beliefs of the temple is that they promote nobility in action and thought. Yet why let her go? Why not give her a real reason for her firing? She says she felt used and betrayed and that while she still holds the seven tenants in her heart, she can't be a member of the temple anymore because of the leaders within the organization. Evelyn Breedlove, who also goes by the Satanic Housewife Online, said that she and her partner were removed from TST in November, 2019. She'd only been there five months, but she'd engaged with her local community right away, aspiring to be a Satanic minister. Yet she was scolded by her chapter leader for having a blog and a book club, as it allowed her to talk to fellow community members in private. They seemed upset that she was being looked up to as a leader. And then not long afterwards, she learned that a previous member had done research on her and learned her real birth name. When Evelyn expressed her concern for her personal safety, she was called a drama queen who sucks the fun out of the chapter. Though perhaps the most damning and concerning story comes from Queer Satanic. They don't reveal the name of the person that made this complaint, so it's extremely difficult to verify at the time. So again, feel free to take this with a grain of salt. According to their post, a member was banned from TST for filing a report about a different member within a leadership position raping them. From what I can tell, both of them were given a one-year ban and the situation was referred to as a toxic episode with the church telling this member that they needed to move on. A detective was allegedly brought into the situation, but there haven't been any updates since. 
I don't know how true these stories are, but what I do know is that TST has not been transparent and clear with their finances. Greaves has an extremely disturbing history and any evidence backing up their claims about how they'll help women's rights is kind of lacking. So all I can really say at the end of the day is this, proceed with caution. But with all of that being said, that is where I'm going to end today's episode of The Corporate Casket. I hope you learned something new here today. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing to stay up to date on all the latest episodes. I appreciate you spending some of your time here with me today, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.